Amen. Thank you, Father. So, again, welcome to uh, ABC Sunday morning on this bright and sunny August morning. I hope it's that way where you are. But if you're listening to this at night, well, maybe not so much. Okay, anyway, <laughs> today we're going to be talking about something that the Lord began to deal with me about, uh, I don't know, several, several months ago. Um, I was reading through um, first, I'm sorry, second Peter, chapter one, uh, where it gives a list there um, of attributes that we should strive for, and it says, to your faith, add virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, to temperance, patience, to patience, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, add love. And I was reading through that uh, passage that I love, passage that I've preached on several times, and the Lord kind of stopped me and he said, that right there, that's where you're at. That's where you need to, to focus your attention. And it was on temperance. So I've been uh, attempting and, and working towards doing that, but I'd never really sat down and studied it. So anyway, this, as, uh, as I was asking the Lord about this message, he said, why don't you teach on temperance, something you need? So I said, okay, I'll do that. So anyway, I believe that the Lord is dealing with me in this area because he actually wants to also deal with you in this area of temperance, of self-control, of self-discipline. An important topic, and we're going to find that today as we go through and, and look at some scriptures that talk about temperance, that talk about our calling and our, uh, the importance of following through on temperance, because temperance is really the power. You want to do what God has called you to do? Temperance, or self-control, is going to be a key to fulfilling God's will. So the will of God is carried out through the agency of man. But man successfully carries out the will of God through temperance. That is our partnership. God has his part, which he has already done through Jesus, and we have our part in carrying out the will of God. So who is it that prays? We do. In other words, we have to do something. God and Jesus many times talks about the importance of prayer. But he doesn't pray for us. Who prays? We do. Who reads and studies the Word of God? The Bible? We do. Who prays for the sick? We do. When we're out in the marketplace doing our, our, uh, what God is, uh, has us doing uh, for our life, and we come across somebody who needs prayer, you know, you can sit there and you can look at it and say, boy, that person really has a challenge. Oh, well. Or God wants to heal them, but it's through you. Who prays for the sick? We do. And I know that that's something that Penny and I enjoy doing. That matter of fact, just the other day we were out somewhere and this lady started talking to us and we saw that she had some issues. So as part of our conversation, uh, Penny took the initiative and uh, we began to pray for her and uh, pray for her uh, physical issues that she was dealing with. Who speaks the word of God? We do. Who ministers to the lost? We do. Who edifies the church of God? We do. It's our stepping out by faith. It's our being led by the power 
of the Holy Spirit. Or I should say, it's our being led, and it's then the power of the Holy Spirit that is working through us. But we have to take the steps. So let's look at some scriptures that talk about why temperance is so important. First one, Colossians 1, 9 through 10, a verse that we should all be familiar with. But let's, let's look at it in detail. I want to show you some things that you may not have seen before. For this cause, we also, since the day we heard of it, so what is the it re referring to? Well, in verses previous to this, uh, Paul is pointing out that the two things that were of particular importance to him that prompted his prayer was their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and their love for the brethren. Faith of the Lord Je in the Lord Jesus Christ and love for the brethren. So when, they heard, when he heard about it, then he, that caused him to begin to pray for them on a regular basis. So he goes on, uh, because since the day we heard of it, we do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So he's praying that they would be filled with the knowledge of God's will. Notice there that it says to pray for you and to desire. Now, I, I, I want to spend a few minutes on this because it helps us to understand more about God's will. So that word desire uh, is the same word that's translated desire in Mark 11.24. What things soever you desire, uh, pray, uh, believing that you shall have them and you will have them. So it's that same word desire, which is also the same word that's translated in most places as ask. Um, and that's actually in the Greek, that word refers to a asking that is actually a demand for something already do you. A demand for something already do you. Um, so, for example, when you go to the bank with your little uh, piece of paper that you have written out to get money out of your account, that is actually referred to as a demand note. So you take that demand note and you give it to the teller, and basically what you're saying is, with this piece of paper, I am demanding this money from my account. If you give that piece of paper to somebody else, in other words, you, you send it to the uh, utility company, then the utility company then takes that demand note, presents it to the, uh, to the bank, and says, this person told me that they have money in their account, and so I am demanding that money as I'm the one that's being listed as the who to pay, I demand that money then be transferred to me. So that's uh, the demand, something that is already due us. So what Paul is saying here is he is demanding that something that is already due them be given to them. So what is he demanding? God's will. And the reason I point that out is because we can all know God's will. God's will for us. He says that you might be filled. Now notice that it says, ye might be. That particular word there, the word filled, that is, is in the subjunctive mood, which means that it is a possibility. It is a probability, which means it takes something from our side to be able to do that. So he's saying, I am demanding this for you, but you have to do something with it. You have to take it and receive it. You have to act on it. It says that you might be filled, and that means completely filled up with the knowledge of his will. That word there, knowledge, is a word we've seen many times in different places. Epigonosco. Not just a knowing in our mind, but a heart knowledge. That you might have a heart knowledge of his will. That you know, that you know, that you know what his will is. 
So what are we talking about when we talk about his will? Well, we're talking about what Jesus has provided for us. We're talking about uh, our character, the holiness that is being worked out through our members because we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We're talking about his daily assignments that he gives us. Uh, we're talking about our destiny. I think of uh, 2 Peter 1, 3, that we have been given, he's given us power for all things pertaining to life, Zoe life, the life of God in us, and godliness. In other words, living out his will in our life, living out our life in a godly manner by the power of God. So all these things are included in his will that we might know. What is it that the word says? What is it that the spirit is leading us? These are the things that his, are his will. So that we might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So these things are spoken to us as revelation to our hearts so that they become engrafted in us so that we know that we know what his will is for us, who we are to be in Christ, what we are to do for him, what good works has he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So as we know these things, as we know his will, then we have a responsibility to then do something with it, to act on his will. And that's where this message come in. That we might walk worthy of the Lord. I was going on to verse 10, by the way, uh, there in Colossians chapter 1. That we might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. What he's basically saying there is that we, because we know his will, then we need to conform our life to be in, um, to be in compliance, to be in alignment with his will. So what we know his will, and therefore then we are carrying it out, walking worthy, walking in alignment with his will which requires temperance, which requires self-control. See, this is exactly the place where the evil one tries to get us. We know what God wants us to do. We have inklings of it from the Word, from the Spirit. We know we've been convicted by some things in our heart. In other words, become a conviction, a revelation of what God wants us to do. But where the devil often trips us up, is right here, the walking worthy. In other words, aligning or conforming our life to meet what God's will has said. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. The hindrances of walking worthy. And what is it that things that can take us off track? The, the next uh, verse after verse 10 in this passage says, Strengthened with all might by his power unto patience and long-suffering. So we already know that there is going to be things that come against us as we try to accomplish his will. We uh, achieve his will in our life, we achieve uh, the blessings that he has promised us through faith and patience. We know that from Hebrews chapter 6, through faith and patience. And the patience is important because there's going to become, there's going to be roadblocks, there's going to be things where the evil one is trying to hinder us. And so in, those, in that things where he's trying to hinder us, we have to have patience, and long-suffering. But in order to work through the patience and the long-suffering to do His will, it's going to require us to be temperate, to be self-controlled, to be disciplined, to continue to follow through. So let's go on to the next point. Number two, the word in a heart of distractions is unfruitful. This is from Mark 4, the parable of the sower. 
I'm going to pick it up in verse 18. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world. In other words, you've heard, you're hearing the word. You're beginning to get a picture of what God wants you to do. In other words, his will. You're hearing the word. It says, and the deceitful, uh, sorry, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust for other things entering in, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Um, I was uh, the other day um, out in the flower bed uh, in the front of our house. Uh, we had this tree that was, uh, that was there, and it, it produced these uh, seed pods. And they would get everywhere. And um, even though the tree's been gone for several months now, I noticed that in this flower bed that all these little trees started popping up. And uh, a couple of them had gotten, you know, six or eight inches tall. And one thing I noticed is when I went to pull them out, uh, the, the tap root was almost as long as the, the part on the top. And I thought, wow, you know, they found some good soil, and they're going into it. Now, just as a, a, a sidelight, you remember uh, before the, uh, the part about the, the thorns and the, uh, the weeds, uh, it talks about that uh, the word is sown in someone's heart. They receive it with joy, but because they have no depth in themselves, then um, it says that it be... Uh, when opposition comes to the word, then they, they wither uh, and it becomes unfruitful. Well, uh, a couple of days later, after I pulled some of those trees out in the front yard, um, I was in the backyard, and the neighbor behind us also has one of those trees. And so there's p pods all over the backyard. Well, in this one area in our backyard, there is a culvert uh, so that uh, water can run through the neighbors, ours and stuff, like when it rains and stuff, a runoff thing. Well, sometimes it gets filled with, with leaves and it gets some dirt in there. Well, I was out there the other day, I noticed that uh, there was several of these trees that had started growing. And so they were, you know, five, six inches tall, and I thought, wow. So I, I grabbed hold of it with the intention that I was going to have to pull on it like in the front. But as I grabbed hold of it and I pulled, it came right up. Because what had happened is the root had only gone down to the concrete, which is only about an inch or so down through the dirt, and just had turned and basically was going nowhere. That tree had no foundation to be able to grow at all. So that's what happens when it's sown on rocky soil. There's no depth, and so it looks good. It seems like it's going to be great, but because there's no depth, they have no root in themselves. So anyway, I thought you might find that interesting. Okay, now going back to the the thing of the um, the thorns. Uh, a, a gal that uh, has a homestead uh, that uh, Penny and I watch her videos from time to time, uh, she last year uh, had this you know big garden on her, her property and on her in her garden she had planted a bunch of uh, tomato plants, different varieties of tomato plants. But what ended up happening is this uh, weed. Uh, it's called a, a devil weed, a, a morning glory, uh, several other uh, names that it's that is used for it. But this this uh, devil weed, what it what it does, it, it's a twiner or a um, a vine, and so it started getting involved, and it was it was going up her her um, tomato plants. Uh, you know the uh, the trellis that she has for the tomato plants was going up that, and it was wrapped around the tomatoes, and she ended, she tried everything she could to try to get rid of it. Um, but nothing worked, and it ended up being a disaster and hardly got any tomatoes off of her vines. So this year she thought, ain't putting up with that again. So what she did was she laid out a barrier and just had a little hole for the tomato plant to come up in. 
And so this year she's expecting a large harvest because those uh, devil weeds aren't going to come up. But I tell you this, it is rightly named if we want to apply it especially the, to this teaching. Because the thorns, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things enter in and choke the word. And so we need in our lives to put up barriers to try to keep the word, the will of God from being choked out in our lives and it being unfruitful. It is so easy to get carried away with things. But one thing that I began to realize as I was dealing with some of these things in my own life is the distractions are not really the problem. Because, <laughs> tell you what, you can turn your phone off, you can erase all the, the apps that you might be tempted to look at in your phone, you can... Uh, uh, set up all kinds of, of things, you lock yourself in a room and say, I'm not going to be distracted by anything. I'm going to spend time with God today. And if in your heart, which we'll talk about in a minute, you really don't want to spend time with the Lord, you really don't want to spend time in the Word, you'll find a way even if you pick up the phone book and start reading it. Something to distract you. You know, you'll think of all the things that have to be done. The bills that need to be paid, the laundry that needs to be done, the dishes that are sitting on the sink, the bathroom that hasn't been cleaned for a week. You'll start thinking about all these different things. It's not the distractions that are the problem. It is you and your and the temptation of the distraction that is before you. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But we do need to take care of these distractions. They become weeds that entangle us and we become unfruitful. In other words, if you're busy doing your hobby that, you're, that becomes a distraction, or you're busy uh, uh, doing whatever kind of things you want to do, you know, watching movies, watching videos, going to ball games, going to movies, these kind of things that you know are just, you're allowing the evil one to use it to distract you that you're not going to be accomplishing what God has called you to do. So let's go on now to the next verse. Out of control desires lead to death. Um, I was... I left it out of the outline, but um, I did want to mention that there are two words that I, that I like that, to me, help describe this. Two biblical words. The word out of, or out of control, the, the biblical word, is lasciviousness. If you ever come across that in the King James, lasciviousness, that's what it means. Out of control. Unable to control yourself. And the other one is desires. Uh, especially as it relates to strong desires. And that's the word concupiscence. Now those are not words that we hear uh, in everyday language, but I happen to, I happen to like them as words. <laughs> not the sin <laughs> of the word, but I don't know. It just kind of rolls off your tongue. Lasciviousness, concupiscence. Okay, anyway. <laughs> James 1, verses uh, 12 through 15. I think you're going to find some amazing things here as we, as we take a look at this. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. And that word there could, is uh, temptation. What we normally think of as temptation, it also can be translated trial or testing. Blessed is the man who endures, in other words, stays strong till the end, endures. Uh, Jesus said, he who endures to the end shall be saved. So this is that talking about that same thing, endures temptation, trials, testing. For when he is tried, he shall receive a crown of life. 
Now, for those of you who have been through the Revelation series, been reading Revelation, that should have just clicked right on you, right in your brain there from Revelation 2, verse 9, talking about the church at Smyrna and that those that were martyred, that as that they would receive a crown of life. So we're going to talk a little bit about that and kind of put these two things together. Receive a crown of life which the Lord has promised to them that love him. A couple of things I want us to see out of this. The, the word temptation, the word uh, tried. Let's see, I think there's, uh, there's one other one. I guess those were the two ones that I wanted to bring out. Okay, now, what I want us to do is, in your Bible, you might recall this verse, and if you want to look at it, in James chapter 1, starting in verse 2, it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Same word. Temptations, trials, testings. Knowing this, that the trying, which is the same word, as tried in verse 12, the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, lacking nothing. So, verse, verses 2 through 4 is the process that temptations the process of the temptations resulting in being perfect and entire, lacking nothing. Verse 12 in particular is the, uh, is the end result of having gone th through and been successful in verses 2 through 4. He who endureth temptation, for when he is tried... Now what's interesting between the word trying or um, the trying of your faith versus tried is that the word tried same word but this time it's in the past tense now it is uh, often re used and referred to the the smelting or the purifying of precious metals uh, with heat so in verse uh, verses uh, 2 there it's talking about, or two and three, it's talking about the trying, in other words, the process in which one is being purified to be perfect and entire, lacking nothing. But in 12, it is the end result. In other words, when he is tried, and that word, the, word, the way the word's used there in, as tried, it's in the past tense, and it actually refers to the purifying having taken place. In other words, you've endured temptation and you are now purified. And it says, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that loved him. So just something for us to consider, that we receive a crown of life when we have become perfected through the trials and tribulations and temptations that the evil one presents to us. So, let's go on. Verse 13, let no man say when he is tempted, tried, or tested, that I am tempted, tried, or tested of God. For God cannot be tempted, tried, or, uh, or te yeah, tem tempted, tried, or tested with evil, <clears throat> neither tempteth he any man. Okay, verse 14. Now this is discussing the, the details of the process from verses 2 through 4. But every man is tempted, tried, and tested when he is drawn away of his own lust. So what's going on here is somebody is heading towards doing what is right. In other words, towards doing the will of God. But what's happened is, something has come in. A temptation, a trial, a testing has come against them to try to stop what God wants to do. 
And it says, every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust. In other words, the temptation has within it something that draws on the man's desires. Now this, of course, uh, can be used for sexual lust, but it's, that's not the primary intent of it. It's just a desire, a strong desire. Concupiscence. Wow, we've heard that word somewhere before. So, the temptation comes, it pulls on this uh, desire in the person, and it says then, <clears throat> drawn away, and then when lust has conceived, what what less conceiving is, we know about how a baby is conceived. Well, in this case, the temptation and the desire come together and it conceives sin. So what, so what are, we, are, are we talking about here? What I'm saying is that what is a temptation is those things that would want to distract us, the, the challenges that would want to distract us, the, the things that, that draw on our desires that want to distract us, the movies, the videos, or whatever it might be, the, the books, the, the, uh, the novels. Um, you know, there's a huge market in uh, Christian romance novels these days. And... Uh, People, you know, have written a uh, series of, you know, 30 books that, t that show the, the life and the loves of, of some Christian woman and man. And as they, they go through the different things, uh, I mean, it's just, and, and people just eat those things up. I mean, they just buy them and buy them and buy them and, you know, the Kindles are full of them. And, and uh, those are distractions. They, they pull on a person's uh, desires. And when I talk about desires here, I'm, I'm really talking about base desires, um, such as the flesh. <clears throat> but they can be other things. Um, they can be fear. Sometimes it's the fear of success. If, if I accomplish God's will in this, then what does that mean I'm going to have to do? What does that mean? I'm, what am I going to have to give up if that becomes a su success? Or it could be the fear of failure. If I try it and it doesn't work, then I, I'm going to fail, and then what's going to happen? So it could be fear. It could be doubt and unbelief. Did God really say, can this really happen? Is that really his promise? So it could be fear or doubt. It could be self-doubt. You know, I, I'm just a plain, simple guy. You know, how can God use me? those kind of, of things. It could just be then, or, or what often these things end up being, are ways of escaping. Ways of not having to deal with what God wants me to do. They, I can get into this distraction. I can get into this thing and it will, it will kind of be an escape. So I don't have to deal with the the trials or the temptations or the, the roadblocks to accomplishing God's will. So, as we desire to do what God has called us to do, evil one comes in and puts in these roadblocks of, of uh, things that can distract and take us out of the will of God. Something to try to de derail what God is wanting to do. But what but what God wants us to do is to learn to overcome these things, to recognize the underlying desires, the underlying things of our nature. You know, do we really want to work all that hard to accomplish these things? You know, I, years ago I, uh, I did a real in-depth study of the book of Proverbs, and I took every single verse in the book of Proverbs and I put it into different categories. Uh, wisdom, knowledge, prudence, uh, you know, uh, diligence, and, and the words of our mouth, and you know, all, the, all the kinds of different categories. And then I, you know, uh, printed it all, or typed it all out and printed it anyway. 
one of the ones I did was on slothfulness, diligence, and uh, laziness. And, I mean, there's a lot of verses. It's like two and a half pages of scriptures just on those. Then what I did was I went through and I looked at each of the ones on slothfulness. And I said, what is the motivation behind the slothfulness? And I came up with, a, with several different things. So some of these might speak to you. There can be a tendency to, do I really want to put out that kind of effort? Laziness, impatience, feeling entitled, selfish, resentment, uh, being irresponsible, the fear of failure, the fear of success, uh, fear imagined, the, the slothful says, oh, there's a lion in the street, um, being complacent, prideful. These are things that somebody who is slothful can, uh, can deal with um, in terms of underlying things that would keep them from doing what God wants them to do that is easily attached to a distraction that can, and a temptation, a trial that can pull them away from what God wants them to do. You know, there was, uh, in the early 1900s, actually it started back in the 1800s, what was called the temperance movement. And it resulted in um, the 18th Amendment to the Constitution, which prohibited the sale and consumption of alcohol. And it uh, was enacted in 1920 but it was repealed in 1933, some 14 years later. The reason why it was repealed, all it did was take a person's lack of self-control in that area, and it just pushed it underground and started a whole industry of bootlegging, of uh, criminal organizations, uh, you've heard of Al Capone and all these guys and Chicago and uh, G-Men and, and all these different things. All uh, primarily was because of the prohibition, the uh, temperance movement. So we can try all day long to put aside this and put aside that and, and don't do this anymore. But unless we deal with the underlying root of the desires of our of our hearts and crucify those things then we are going to continue to find ways look for ways invent ways to be distracted don't worry I know it sounds a little bit negative right now but we're going to get into some good things in just a minute so hold on okay uh, fourth one there a living sacrifice calls us to temperance to dying to self. A verse that we're all familiar with. I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable to God. That right there automatically indicates that there's going to be self-discipline involved in terms of holiness. In terms of being acceptable to God which is our reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? That you may, able, may be able to prove what is the good, acceptable, and the perfect will of God. So here we see that this sacrifice is tied in with the renewing of our mind. And we're going to see how that fits together because temperance is an issue as it relates to our mind. So we present our bodies a living sacrifice. Galatians 2.20 says that we are to be crucified. We have been crucified with Christ. And it's not us that lives, but Christ lives in us. And we live our life by the faith of the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. Many times Jesus talks about that we need to 
take up his cross and follow him. Another way of talking about the living sacrifice. Another way of talking about being crucified with Christ. So now let's take a look at the word itself, temperance, in the Greek. There's only seven uh, uh, scriptures, or seven times I should say, six different scriptures that use the word temperance or temperate. And it means to be self-controlled, to, um, to exercise self-restraint, to, con- to be self-controlled. I'm looking here at the, at the, uh, the noun, the verb, and the adjective. Um, It it means to be strong in a thing, to be masterful, self-controlled in appetite, temperate. So let's take a look at how these are used in the Word of God. Temperate is a crucial part of the fruit of the Spirit. Now we all uh, know this, we've been through the uh, healing school, school of dominion, and we've learned a lot about the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, which refer primarily to the heart. Patience or long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, which refer primarily to the soul. And then faith, meekness or humility, and temperance or self-control, so which refer primarily to the mind, to our interaction with the world. And we learned, uh, as we were taught here on the fruit of the Spirit, that we need to take an escalator. There is the love at the top of the fruit of the Spirit, and we have temperance or self-control at the bottom of the, of the fruit of the Spirit. And by exercising self-control to, go to move towards love, towards God's love for us and our love towards Him, It requires us getting on this escalator. And the first step on getting on the escalator is temperance or self-control. Because it's having to do with the mind, these three last three things, that is that it has to do with something that we have to do. We have to be more involved in this. The, The love, joy, and peace is primarily an action of the of God in us and our response to that, but faith, meekness, and temperance is something we do, that we're more involved in. Not that we don't need the help of the Holy Spirit, because the Lord knows that we do, but uh, it's more involved in us taking the initiative. Matter of fact, with meekness or, or humility, uh, the Scripture never gives the indication that God is humbling somebody. It always says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Um, walk in humility. So it's something that we take an action in to do, to place ourselves in that place. So that's temperance, self-control as part of the fruit of the Spirit. Let's go on to the next one. Striving to be our best for God will require temperance. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 and 25. Know ye not that they which run in a race all run. What race are we talking about? In terms of spiritually, we're talking about the race to fulfill God's will. Run in a race, we all run, but one receives the prize. So run that you might attain. In other words, do whatever is necessary that you might attain to winning the race, to doing what God has called you to do. And every man that strives, that is pressing for mastery, in other words, for excellence in doing the will of God in their life, conforming their life, being walking worthy to please God, walking worthy of the will of God, everyone that strives for mastery is temperate in all things. In other words, will be self-controlled. Now, that's important. Every man who strives for mastery. Notice the passion there. Notice the desire, the godly desire to accomplish his will. The, the passion to do what he has told us to do. 
And that mastery, that desire, I should say, will cause us to be temperate, to be controlled, to not just deal with the distractions, but to also deal with the underlying desire that pushes us towards those distractions. Now, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible crown. He goes on there in verse 27 at the end. He says, but I buffet my body, bringing it under control. So that is part of the temperance, is controlling our body. And number three there, temperance is a key character quality of an elder who is an elder, who is, and it also uses the word bishop here, who is that person? That is one that has been practicing the word of God, been practicing doing the word of God in their lives. That's what has set them in a place where they are recognized as an elder or a bishop, someone to go to and say, hey, I see quality char or character qualities in you. I see you're accomplishing things for the Lord. Uh, tell me about how to do that. So <clears throat> it says, as a steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, <clears throat> a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, self-controlled. <clears throat> Let's go on now to letter C, the process of developing temperance from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. Faith leads to virtue, leads to knowledge, leads to temperance, leads to patience, dot, dot, dot. So 2 Peter, let me read that to you again. I quoted it earlier, but let me read it to you. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. Besides this, giving all diligence, key word there, diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity or love. For if these things be in you and abound, in other words, they are growing. They are uh, producing things in your life. They, you are abounding in these things. They make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that word, their knowledge, is the same word that's used in uh, Colossians chapter 1. The knowledge of his will. That you be not barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, of what he has done, who he is, what his word says, that we know that we know, the epigonosco, the heart knowledge. So these things help us to get to that. So, what we, what we want to do, notice at, that it is add, to your faith add, to virtue add. So, these are not just a list, but they are a pathway for us to follow because we are adding one to the other to the other. So this is important. I want us to look at this because this takes us then from faith to temperance. Temperance being that self-control to be able to do God's will. So let's start with faith. Our trust in our Father. And I, I word it that way on purpose because faith is a relational thing. It's understanding that God is our Father. It's understanding that He is a good God. It is understanding that He has sent Jesus. And through Jesus, He has provided everything that we need. And through that relationship with Him, understanding His heart, understanding his mind, that out of that trust, out of that uh, confidence in who God is and our relationship with him as our Father, then faith is birthed and faith can grow. If we doubt 
God's goodness, if we doubt the truth of His Word, if we doubt His power, then we will be doubting Him. And it's hard to trust in a Father that we don't trust. So in trusting Him, that is our the basis. We trust our Father for what He has done through Jesus. That is a that is where our faith begins. Now, I've shared this, uh, we've shared this testimony uh, in the past, but one of the things about faith, uh, one of the definitions of faith from uh, Hebrews 6.12, as used in the Amplified Classic Bible, is that faith is the the giving, the reliance of our whole being on God, trusting His love, His goodness. And so when we have put the full weight of our being on Him in whatever area, that is showing our trust, our full confidence, our full being resting on Him. I remember this the testimony I was starting to refer to was uh, several years ago when uh, Penny and I had taken a, a trip and when we were in the airport in Denver there was uh, an incident that occurred and, and Penny ended up falling and uh, really hurting her her right arm which I we believe was uh, what happened was that there was a, a dislocation of her shoulder because uh, she it was in great pain and basically she could hardly use her right arm but what was interesting about that was Penny's reliance on God as her healer putting the full weight of her being people offered do you want us to call 911 do you want us to get security do you want us, you know all this kind of stuff she said no 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 we don't and we got our things together and just kept going even though she was in immense pain we got to the person got down to the person that was picking us up and kind of talked a little bit about what had happened oh do you want me to drive us to the hospital no <laughs> and so it was standing in faith penny is an amazing woman of faith and i have seen not just that incident incident but some other incidences that is just like wow she is just really standing in faith. When we have that kind of trust in our Father, that kind of trust in what Jesus has done, then that trust becomes a, a passion, a motivation to do what He has said for us to do. To When we know what His will is, we desire to do it because we have reached a point where we are in awe of God. We have a reverence for Him, a fear for Him, a passion, a desire to please Him. And then to that faith, we are to add virtue. And this particular word virtue means it's, it's actually manly. It can be translated manly. And what it's talking about is stepping up to who we are in Christ <clears throat> with courage and conviction. It is an attitude. So we know what God's will is. We have an attitude that we are going to step up to the plate and we are going to do it. And then fourth, knowledge is then understanding what God has done for us and how to walk in it. So when we understand what God has done, then to that, so we have our faith, we have our attitude, and we have knowledge and understanding, then temperance is the next thing. In other words, using self-control to be a child of God and to take the steps and actions necessary to achieve God's will and destiny in our lives. And actually, the affirmations that we have been working on are just great affirmations for 
accomplishing these things in our life. The affirmation from Romans 6 11 that um, in uh, Romans 6 11 um, I reckon myself in the name of Jesus I reckon myself to be dead in sin but alive unto God through Christ Jesus. Psalm 1914 in the name of Jesus the words of my mouth the meditations of my heart are acceptable to him and 1 Corinthians 2 16 in the name of Jesus I have the mind of Christ as we have been doing those affirmations it deals with those underlying sins those underlying desires it deals with the words of our mouth and our um, the meditations of our hearts and it deals with our mind so that as we have the mind of Christ as we're moving in these directions then we can trust what God has said we know what to do and that we can enact temperance in our lives self-control to accomplish his will let's just talk for a minute now about as we end here about temperance in the ending days the these three scriptures that I have here all are in the context of the ending days from first Timothy chapter 4 uh, ver uh, verse 1 actually starts with now the spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some will depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils and so as he's giving Timothy instruction here in verse 6 he says this if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things thou shall be a good minister of Jesus Christ nourished in other words feeding uh, on the Word of God nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine uh, whereunto thou hast been thou hast attained but refuse profane and old wives tales in other words distractions and exercise thyself rather unto godliness so in the end times not only do we need to do it ourselves but encourage others to uh, exercise themselves unto godliness and that of course that exercise there means uh, to train or to discipline oneself it goes right back to first uh, Corinthians 9 about being temperate in all things number two what matter of person ought you to be in holy conversation and godliness from second Peter 10 I'm sorry chapter 1 verses chapter 3 verses 10 and 11 I left off the three there second Peter chapter 3 verses 10 and 11 but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements which melt with fervent heat the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation lifestyle and godliness notice how many times that we've come across the scripture or in the these scriptures we've been looking at how many times we've come across godliness and we know from uh, Romans chapter 6 that godliness is the result of the living out of the righteousness of who we are in Christ Jesus godliness the living out being without spot or wrinkle or any such thing uh, being walking in the perfection that we are in Christ Jesus these things are immensely important in these last days to be able to discipline ourselves to be holy in our in our actions and our words and to see godliness flow out of our lives first Peter 4 talks about basically the same thing but in but the end of all things is at hand be ye therefore sober uh, somber uh, serious and watch unto prayer not talking here about having a dour look on your face you know the uh, the church of the uh, frigid or uh, you know all of us being baptized in uh, in ice-cold water none of that kind of stuff I'm not talking about not having joy 
not being able to laugh or to smile. But even in the midst of that, we need to realize the seriousness of these days. To watch and to pray, and above all things, that thou hast fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. So again, putting um, ourselves in alignment with God's word as we discipline ourselves with temperance. So temperance is a key thing, and it has power. When we have the passion from our love of Jesus and the desire to please him, the desire to do his will, and we have put down the uh, desires of the flesh and we have uh, put aside the distractions of the evil one that through every trial, every temptation that the evil one tries to bring to thwart the will of God, we're able to push through that and to do what God has called us to do. See, we don't have to be concerned about the outcome of doing God's will. That's his, that's, his, that's, that's on him. What we do is we need to do what he has told us to do and let him bring the outcomes that he desires. Amen.